to the report. But to me, that's not an open and fair consultation or dialogue by simply saying, by showing letters of people complaining that they weren't involved in the consultation in an appropriate way. Um, I know we agreed we're going to talk about unity today. I just had to get that off my chest. Um, uh, now, the other, the, other, the other point I want to make is I want to pick up on something that uh, Mudassan Ahmed uh, led with, which I thought was an interesting point about um, losing our own audience and the power of uh, the Muslim or Muslim purchasing power. And I'll share with you one anecdote, and then I'll jump into my presentation. Uh, in lobbying various government officials within the EU about the international trade implications of the uh, amendment 205 to the European Union Food Labeling Bill, I had the opportunity and privilege to sit with various officials from the government of Qatar who were interested in hearing about this. And in the context of that conversation, they made clear that their view was stunning is not allowed, they would never eat stunned, pre-stunned meat in their country, and the person who I was meeting with, who was the number two representative of the government of Qatar in Belt, in Brussels, said it would never happen in his country. And then I pointed out to him uh, that indeed his country imports literally tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of pre-stunned meat from New Zealand. And he said it's not possible. Um, the next day, his people asked me to come and bring them the numbers, which I did, all publicly available. So I think the concept of losing our own audience is I'm not ever, even sure the audience was had in the first place. And I think it's a big problem. And I think the point about purchasing power, the Muslim community is the largest purchasing block of New Zealand's primary export. And New Zealand community, New Zealand government, has recently banned the slaughter of meat without stunning. Is that truly taking account and accommodating your, your, your business partner, your key business partner? I'd say not. And frankly, whether you, whether you want to, whether you think that stunning is haram or halal, or whether it can be, uh, if you can massage the issue in a certain way, my view is if you're looking at how you're going to leverage your power, one phone call from the GCC to the people in New Zealand saying, you know what, we're not interested in accepting what we were willing to accept 30 years ago because we decided to take our approach to the religious issue a bit differently would end the debate overnight. Overnight. <laughs> now, and, and by the way, I'm looking to elevate, I, we are working with the GCC, Qatar is raising this issue at the GCC level. It's going to be a long process and there's currently a lawsuit, but to all my friends here from Brazil and Argentina and the Latin American countries that make really good meat and lamb but don't stun, I think you're missing a trick in your market. From where I'm, uh, with due respect, I, I think the key there is, you need to market what in America, and the MC will know, Burger King ran an ad and said, have it your way. They're going to make the burger the way you want to make it. And I would think the Brazilians and the Argentinians could start marketing to the GCC countries in a way where saying, the New Zealanders who you're giving hundreds of millions of dollars to every year don't care about what your people, what your consumers are saying. Every one of these surveys that you'll see is going to say, your consumers want unstunned meat. I think you're entitled to demand it. Uh, all right, let me give you a quick baseline on where we are within the European Union. Council directives. Um, all animals have to be stunned before their slaughter within the EU, with the exception of uh, religious exceptions, so for halal and kosher. Okay? And halal meat is produced within the EU uh, under this exemption for no, no stunned meat. Now, people who are importing or exporting meat to the EU have to comply with the same standards. That's the bottom line bit, uh, point of this slide. So again, if you're producing halal or kosher meat uh, outside of the EU for export to the EU, um, you can slaughter without stunning and have that meat uh, imported or exported to the EU. Uh, now, the EU proposal that's on the table uh, you have, uh, in 2008, a Food Labeling Act came out. I had nothing to do with halal, kosher, slaughter without stunning, slaughter with stunning. It was basic consumer information regarding fat content, calories, what's the best way to deliver that information to the consumer, consumer perceptions of same, etc. Uh, somewhere along the lines in the process, uh, MEP Renata Summer from Germany uh, snuck in Amendment 205. 
Amendment 205 said that if meat was slaughtered without stunning, it would have to have a label on it that would say meat from slaughter without stunning. Now, there's been a lot of dialogue and engagement within Brussels on this issue, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. Um, but the currently the European Union legislative procedure, as, as many of you know, is fairly complex. The European Commission on the 1st of September rejected the amendment, but that's not, that doesn't mean we've won. It's a good step, but it doesn't mean we've won. Uh, the bill is now before the Council. The Council can accept the bill without the amendment, but that's unlikely to happen because there are so many other parts of the bill that are controversial that it's going to end up before the European Parliament again. That's what our people are telling us in Brussels. That's the sense I get from engaging up in Brussels. So I think we can expect to see 205 put back in the bill when the bill comes back to Parliament. So the fight is very much on, and there's still plenty we can do, and I'll talk about that. Now, right after this amendment came out, we saw an um, article in The Independent where you had Jewish and Muslim uh, leaders coming together to say that this was a form of, quote, naked discrimination, and they had fairly targeted kosher and halal products, mentioning you know, the point about misstuns. But I mean, this is just an example of people aren't happy with this, and it's time to speak up about it. Uh, now, here are some views of MEPs who have given statements within the European, Parli dis European parliamentary discussions about um, their opposition. And you'll see I've highlighted the relevant bits here. You have Rosette Francois from France talking about stigmatizing certain religious groups uh, as labeling of this nature would create ill-founded distrust amongst consumers, among certain consumers. And then you have Frédéric Riez from, I apologize for my poor French pronunciation of the name, um, from Belgium, who said again, this would stigmatize these products for no purpose and would be particularly counterproductive for the sector. <clears throat> now, I, I believe, it's my perception, maybe I'm drawing this a bit, but my view is that this label is not about consumer information which we'll get into a little bit when, when we look at the objectives of the government uh, in putting forward this, this amendment. Frankly, I think it's, a, it's to denormalize religious practice. I mean, this is not the first thing that we've seen coming up within Europe that is aimed to denormalize religious practice that others might think extreme, but for some of us is very normal. Um, now, in terms of what the consumers want and what the uh, halal scholars or UK halal scholars said, the uh, Halal Monitoring Committee did a, a very nice survey from June through August 2009. Uh, and basically, you have the data here. 99% of respondents indicated that they prefer slaughter without any type of study. About 90% of respondents rejected electrical study for poultry, and 85% of respondents rejected electrical study for lamb, sheep, and cow. Now, could you come up and tell me you've got other surveys that go a different way on some of these issues? Sure. Can you come up and tell me, oh, I think HMC is, is, has a slanted view of the world? Sure. Does it not mean that there's a significant portion of the population that would prefer to have it this way? And are there rights not to be accommodated? That, that's the point. I'm not here to, we don't have to, we don't have to win that issue here per se. There's going to be a difference of opinion. But the point is, for those who want it this way, for those who want to take it, I think, another level in terms of how they're going to treat the issue of halal vis-a-vis -vis meat production, they should be accommodated. I don't, I, there's, there's no rational reason not to. Indeed, uh, now let, let's talk about you know, whether stunning is compatible with halal. And this is an area where I'm sure if it's called everyone in here will have different views on the details, and I'm not a Sharia law expert. But the Malaysians allow limited use of reversible electric, electric, electrical and percussive stunning. Now the GCC doesn't allow percussive stunning, but does allow limited use of electrical stunning. Now, what I have below, but the point obviously is that it's all about reversible. And the ability to identify reversibility with a, a reasonable degree of scientific certainty on an individual animal basis within a commercial context is virtually nil. It's virtually nil. Um, and now, here are the, here are the uh, types of study that are required within the EU if you're not going to be performing in religious order. But the point I want to raise is that in 2013, 
there are more rigid standards coming in within the EU in terms of what is stunning. Now, I raise this because not because we necessarily will lose the right to slaughter without stunning, but I raise it because this is the demarcation for what will be considered stunned versus not stunned meat for purposes of labeling under Article 205. So it may very well be the case that you are halal under Malaysian standards, or it may very well be the case that you are halal under GCC standards, but as these things come into force within the EU, you may not be doing enough. And it's, it's really, it's an open question, and again, it's an area for accommodation, not restriction, in my view. But you may not be qualified as uh, having stunned by EU standards, and therefore you will also have to label as meat slaughtered without stunning, because you didn't do it the way the EU wanted you to uh, stun. Now, I say that only because I think it would be naive to believe that we are uh, in a world where if you're going to do some light, what I'll call stunning light, which is the uh, reversible stunning that uh, is accepted by the Malaysians or the GCC, and I think even amongst the GCC that view is turning. Um, and I think we may see revisions of those standards from the discussions that I've had, certainly with the Qataris. Um, you're all, it's to be naive to believe that you're going to be able to say, I don't have to label as meat slaughtered with uh, out stunning if you do this stunning level. And that obviously raises significant trade implications. Why? Because what does this label say to the consumer? It says that you're a second class type of meat. You're less humane, necessarily. It's a pejorative label. That's the message it sends. It's don't buy this meat if you're going to. Because there's something else that's better. Now, of course, that's also within the context of, let's not forget, uh, and of course I and the MC are probably biased uh, with our US roots, but the United States government long ago determined as a matter of fact and law that religious slaughter was humane. Now, you don't have to agree with the United States on everything, but that one, I don't think you have a problem. Um, the other thing I want to raise again, I've mentioned Temple Brandon and uh, Dr. Rosen. There is literature out there that has been peer-reviewed by world-class experts that have made the case that religious slaughter without stunning is just as good and is just as humane as slaughter with stunning, taking into account misstuns, other problems, and the relative weak nature of the literature that exists to date trying to compare uh, slaughter, uh, stunning with slaughter and without slaughter. Now, the EU proposal, they tell you it's all about consumer information. Let's look at the bottom quote here. When they put in Amendment 205, what did they say? Consumers should be informed that certain meat is derived from animals which have not been stunned. This will enable them to make an informed choice in accordance with their ethical concerns. And again, this was this kind of this mantra is now parroted by those who want to push forward and get 205 pet. So you have a one MVP here saying, again, this isn't about stigmatizing religion, but it's simply about letting European citizens consume food with full knowledge of the facts. Relevant language, full knowledge of the facts. Is that really going to give people full knowledge of the facts? We're singling out one type of bringing the animal to the, to, to the consumer. One type of slaughter, one type of animal killing, and we're saying, this is different from everything else. Well, if consumers are concerned about that, maybe, wouldn't they be concerned about the, the percentage of misstuns? Shouldn't we tell them that certain animals are electrocuted to death? Shouldn't we tell them that certain animals are gassed to death? Shouldn't we tell them how they're gassed and then they're slaughtered? Uh, the point is, if consumer information was a legitimate government objective, we'd be doing it in a whole different way, which to me raises the issue that this is not about consumer information. Because if it was, we'd be providing people with a whole lot of information, and then I think we'd see the farm lobby going absolutely berserk. Because no one wants to see all that information about how the animal was killed on the label, on the shelf, when they go to Tesco. They don't want to see it. <clears throat> now, so again, the effect of this is to, to single out uh, uh, meat that was slaughtered without stunning. And this would distort, this is where we get into sort of legal argumentation, it would distort the international trade 
in these products and present an impermissible barrier trade to allow meat exporting countries' ability to compete